All right, I'm back. A bunch of you have been sending me messages asking where I am. Some of you said you're worried that something happened to me. For future reference, if you don't see me for a while, it's because I'm working on something important enough for me to stop doing everything else. If you watch my videos and debates, you've seen me say that we can trace all of Muhammad's teachings and practices to the groups that were around him in the 7th century. You've seen me say that if we take certain beliefs and stories of the Jews, and certain beliefs and stories of the Christians, and certain stories and practices of the pagans, and we roll them up into a ball, we get Islam. I've made that point dozens of times, but I always knew that there was something missing. Muhammad only took some teachings from the Jews. He only took some teachings from the Christians. He only took some practices from the pagans. So Islam isn't just the product of the beliefs and practices that were circulating in Arabia during the time of Muhammad. It's also the product of some sort of selection process, which leads to the question, why did Muhammad choose the beliefs and stories and practices that ended up as part of Islam? And up until about two months ago, I always thought that he simply tried to fit as much together as he could, and he left out whatever wouldn't fit. Then one day, I was hanging out with Anthony Rogers, and he was talking about Paul Witz's book, Faith of the Fatherless, which is about the impact fathers have on the religious beliefs of their children. You wouldn't even think about Muhammad when you're reading this book, because it focuses on theism and atheism. But Tony pointed to a passage at the end of the book and said, read that and think about Muhammad. And suddenly, I understood why Muhammad chose the beliefs and practices that are now part of Islam. But I wanted to make sure I was right, so I've spent the past several weeks studying the psychology of religion. Psychology of religion usually doesn't deal with whether religious beliefs are true or false. It deals with psychological factors that can play a role in what we believe. For instance, if your father's a pastor who beat you every night when you were a kid, that experience might not just affect your view of your father. It might also affect your view of the church, authority figures, God, and so on. And here's what's interesting. When you look at Muhammad's childhood, and you do some research in the psychology of religion, and you ask, what sort of religious beliefs and practices would someone with Muhammad's childhood experiences find appealing? The answer is, precisely the sorts of beliefs and practices which, when collected together, are now called Islam. In other words, I once explained Islam in terms of what it's made of and where those beliefs and practices came from. But there was something missing, namely, why those beliefs and practices, rather than others, became part of Islam. And now we have that missing piece of information, because we know from psychology why someone like Muhammad would favor the beliefs and practices that he favored. So, we now have a complete explanation for the origin of Islam. And when you put it all together, it's so clear that I think I might actually understand Muhammad and Islamic theology better than anyone else in history. That's a pretty extreme claim to make, so let me clarify. I'm not saying I know more facts about Muhammad or the Quran or Islamic theology than other people. There are many people who know far more facts than I do. But studying facts and information is very different from entering Muhammad's head and digging down deep into his subconscious and documenting the psychological origins of Islam. That's what I've done. Now, the good part for you is that since I understand Muhammad and Islamic theology better than anyone else in history, you're about to understand Muhammad and Islamic theology better than anyone else in history besides me, because I've studied everything and can put it all together into a video. So, for you jihadis who keep telling me that you're going to kill me, may I suggest you do it within the next few days, because I'm about to make what may be my favorite video ever. Clock's ticking, cupcakes. Now for some updates, since I've been off the grid. While I'm putting together my Psychology of Islamic Theology video, I've got a couple of shorter videos to make. Once the Psychology video is posted, I've got another batch of videos that I need to finish up because I've been putting them off for years and still haven't made them. Side note on why I'm trying to get those videos done. A few months ago, when I started a Patreon campaign, I said that we'd have a video planning team on Patreon. When I came up with that plan, I thought it was going to be like 15 or 20 people, and that they would send in topics by email, 
and I'd send back an email with the suggested topics and people could vote on them. It would all be nice and smooth. But hundreds of people signed up, which is really good because that's what you want to happen on Patreon. But I had no idea how to organize and vote on videos with that many suggestions coming in. I've heard that there's a polling system on Patreon, but I have problems with the Patreon website. Some of the pages are jumbled up on my computer, so it's hard to tell what I'm doing. I thought that they just had a lame website, so I figured they'd eventually fix it. But I noticed that some other sites do the same thing on my computer, like certain pages on Rotten Tomatoes. Everything that should be spread out on the page is all in one pile. I'm mentioning this because some of you are tech people and might know how to fix that, which would make my life easier because I won't have to go to other computers to do things on Patreon. So PM me if you know what causes that problem. I can send you screenshots if you need them. Anyway, I figured that if there are going to be a bunch of people suggesting video topics, I could just focus on those topics instead of coming up with my own topics. But I knew that I had somewhere between 15 and 20 videos that I'd started working on months or years earlier, but had never finished because they'd be harder to edit or required a lot of extra reading or were just longer. Uh, one of the downsides of making YouTube videos is that you start thinking in terms of how many hits a video is going to get and you measure success by hits. And the reason that's a problem is that I sometimes think of a video that would make an awesome point, but I know it'll take me two weeks to research it and put it all together. So I start working on it, but as I'm working on it, I keep thinking of other videos that would be much easier and quicker to make because I've already read the books and have all of the sources laid out. Then I end up making easier videos and never get around to finishing the original video. And some of my most popular videos were really easy to make. I posted a video called Three Quran Verses Every Christian Should Know. I basically jotted down the verses while I was heading home on the subway. I sat down and recorded the video. When I got home, million views. Other times, I'll read three or four books to make a video, spend a week preparing notes, and another day or two recording and editing 30,000 views. So the inclination is to focus on the easier videos because if they do well, great. If they don't do well, doesn't matter because they didn't take up a lot of time. But this channel was founded on awesome content. So sometimes you just have to lock yourself in a room and say, I'm not coming out until I get this video done. I made a batch of these a couple of months ago, the Deuteronomy deduction, Scooby-Doo in the case of the silly skeptic, things like that. And you're about to get another batch of these. So the plan is to finish up some more videos that have been building up for a while. And yes, the Paul versus Muhammad video is on that list. We also want to post a couple of videos on slavery this month. Last February, I posted a video titled Muhammad, the White Prophet with Black Slaves. And I got a lot of messages from Muslims telling me that Muhammad abolished slavery which means that I have to take these Muslims on a quick trip to planet reality. But if we're going to talk about slavery in Islam, it only makes sense that we talk about slavery in the Christian West. So we will. We're going to wrap up all of these projects this month. Then we're going to spend all of March doing videos by request. If you're on that list through Patreon, I just sent a message with an email address. Send your topics to that address. Again, I have problems with the Patreon site, so if you don't get the message, let me know. Since this is new, I'm asking those of you who have video topics to start off with one topic this month until we see how many people are submitting requests and how we're going to organize them and vote on them and so on. Once we've got a system in place, the video planning will probably turn out to be a pretty straightforward process. But one way or another, we're going to get a list of videos that will be our video topics for next month. If it works out and you guys are coming up with good topics, we might just stick with doing videos by request for several months. By then, some additional projects for which I'm slowly stockpiling equipment will be coming into play. More on that later. For now, get ready for a crash course in the psychology of religion.